on Larry King now, Stephen Dorff. You know, what I'm trying to do now is do films and characters that I can just keep stretching myself and keep creating. This was a totally different challenge, and uh, I'm liking that some people are, are responding to it. Was uh, being young and making money and being in movies, did that hurt in any way? I think it can be very disillusioning as far as materialism, success. You know, there's a lot of things that look appealing. You know, I, I credit my, I, I credit my mom and dad. I think that's why I never went off the deep end. My brother, uh, in the last five years, really was pounding Nashville down as far as writing incredible lyrics for everybody, from Blake Shelton to Kenny Chesney. And he passed away strangely. All I know is, is um, my brother should be here and uh, he should be enjoying his success. Plus, Larry, I'll do an interview one day. One day, you, brother. If I do you, I gotta do everybody. I do you, Lair, I gotta see Charlie. and I gotta visit a couple others. But Lair, I'll hold you close. <laughs> All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest is Stephen Dorff, known for his roles in movies like Blade, Public Enemy, Somewhere, and The Power of One. Stephen's latest project might be his most personal yet. He stars in and co-wrote Wheeler, about an aspiring musician from Texas who heads to Nashville with the dream of trying his hand at country music. Wheeler's in select theaters and on demand right now, and there's also an album from the movie, Wheeler. That's you on the cover, but it doesn't look like you. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is, what happened here? Basically, we, uh, um, we wanted to do something different, Larry, with this one, you know? We, we figured if, if we dropped into Nashville in a, you know, with a movie crew and trailers and a full screenplay and a bunch of actors playing songwriters, um, we've kind of seen that film. There's been some great ones. There's been some not so great ones. Uh, I didn't really want to make a film like that and kind of, um, what I wanted to do was see if this guy could live on the ground and and kind of, so what we did was uh, I had a meeting with Christian Tinsley, who's an incredible makeup artist who I've worked with on a few films, and uh, he's responsible for the makeup in Westworld, that new great show, and he and was he nominated. Here. And he built a kind of a new face. We had four pieces, a, a chin, a lip, a nose, a mole, and some bushy eyebrows, and a wig. And once I was able to fill this guy, I would say 60% of the movie is, uh, is all, it's all live music. It's all, if I bomb, then we're gonna write a Where scene about that. Uh, you... We shot in Nashville, in the heart of Music City. Got into the Bluebird, film's never been shot in there. We got, almost got into the Ryman, the famous Ryman Theater. But really uh, wanted to see if we could, we knew we had some good songs, but um, we wanted to see if we could drop in there and. Kind of the way probably a Sasha Baron Cohen does a Barat or one of these comedies. How much you know, of it is improvised? The whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah, twelve-page treatment, some makeup, and uh, and a guitar and a is piano. Is it kind of like a documentary? We filmed it as such, and to the point where hopefully you kind of forget about the cameras and you get sucked into this character portrait, which is really a music movie. Now, in a CD, it says written and performed by Wheeler Bryson, but there is no Wheeler Bryson. <laughs> no. It's you. Yeah. But you so have enveloped this role that you have become Wheeler Bryson. For this one, yeah. Well, why don't you have this guy do your makeup every day and just become Wheeler Bryson? Live well, it would have been, it'd be way too expensive. I thought about it, and then <laughs> I'd be doing this like Banksy in the art world, you know? I'd be doing this for 15 years, and I want to make other movies and make some money, too. Are so. you a singer? I am now, I guess. Uh, you know, people have really responded to the, the music, which I'm really, you know, I never wanted to do a Steven Dorff album. I did want to do something with my music because I come from the world of songwriting. My father. Yeah, tell me, your father is... Yeah, I grew up, moved to L.A. when I was three months old. We lived uh, off Tahunga Avenue in Studio City and in a little apartment, and my dad wrote Every Which Way But Loose for the Clint Eastwood film, Eddie yeah. Rabbit, and that went number one. And then my dad wrote Through the Years by Kenny Rogers. He wrote... Uh, uh, songs for Whitney Houston, Celine Dion, Barbra Streisand, all George Strait's hits. And so, you know, my dad's had 15 number ones um, in his career. He's got a big one on the charts now with Garth Brooks called uh, Let's Lay Down and Dance or Baby Let's Lay Down and Dance or something. And that's doing well. And uh, my brother uh, in the last five years really was pounding Nashville down as far as writing incredible lyrics for 
everybody from Blake Shelton to Kenny Chesney. He had four number ones in the last couple years. So. And he passed away strangely. Yeah, you know, this was a film that I, um, I put my left foot into this world and wanted to do it justice. I would never have ventured into this if I didn't think we had something to prove or say. Um, did he and, write the song? And my brother and I got to write the single with a, with a, your biggest fan, Bobby Tomberlin, who's uh, in the film and the real songwriter and really helped vouch for this character. My biggest fan? He loves you, man. After, yeah. we might have to make a quick little phone call because he's like, I can't believe I'm missing Larry King. You know, <laughs> He's been all over New York and on all the shows with me, but uh, he was really... You know, my wife, father-in-law, right? Carpenter Avenue, you were a kid. I know, we have all these connections. Uh, and I've always loved your interviews. But to go back to my brother just real quick, you know, I love my brother so much. He was 40 years old. Tragic accident in Turks and Caicos. Vacationing? Vacationing. Taking a trip to celebrate all his, you know. My brother was making more money than me. It was kind of cool because for years I let him borrow money and stuff. And <laughs> when I put a lot of my money into this little pet project of mine, Wheeler, uh, which everybody told me not to do, I, I still wanted to see this idea through. And now we got a real movie and Andrew really loved the film. and. Uh, the fact that he's included on this album with the single, which is really the song of the album, is a... How did he die? You know, we don't know officially, but there was some drinking involved, there was a jacuzzi involved, and there was um, water involved. And Andrew was splashing around, probably trying to cool off and with some friends, and um, somebody spotted him laying on his back, not moving. And they brought him onto the beach, and some stuff happened, you know, and I don't really, can't really get into the um, particulars, but all I know is is um, my brother should be here and uh, he should be enjoying his success. He's got Rascal Flatts' new hit, uh, Yours If You Want It, which is such a cool song. Um, we've been listening to it a lot lately because this is a bittersweet one for me, you know. I mean, this is my brother, my only brother, and... Uh, Did he have a big funeral? Huge tribute in Nashville. I mean, talk about what a beautiful community. And uh, even shooting Wheeler, I didn't really understand what my brother knew as a community of songwriting. And I mean, there was 1,100 people there. You know, you had Laurie McKenna and just incredible singer songwriters singing for Andrew. And it was, uh, it was beautiful, man. Were you a kid actor? I was. What was your. I mean, I did a movie that uh, Quentin Tarantino never lets me live down. Every time I see him, it was a film called The Gate, which was a film I did when I was like 12 years old, a horror movie. And the audition, they just said, scream. And I was like, ah! And they're like, you're hired. And uh, I ended up going to Toronto with my grandma, was my guardian, came with me, and we made this little movie that ultimately became a big hit. And, the uh, Gate? Yeah, it was like this cult hit. And then I didn't do a movie. I did a bunch of TV shows. I was on Roseanne, and every guest starred on every TV show that I grew up watching, different strokes, you know. I think I did every t Family Ties. I think I did every episode of every show except the love boat. I really wanted to be on the love boat, you know, but I never quite got on there. Our but, guest is the actor and fledgling country star Stephen Dorff. A lot of great write-ups about this movie. We're talking longevity after the break. Our guest is Stephen Dorff. The film is Wheeler. The CD is Wheeler. He is Wheeler. Wheeler has overtaken his life. He has become Wheeler. He looks now like Wheeler. This is, this is, he doesn't look like him, but this is Wheeler. And Wheeler is playing in select theaters. What's next? Musically or filmically? Musically. Mm, musically. Well, it's funny, you know, I, I've been cornered by some, uh, at the LA premiere and in Nashville, I was getting given a lot of business cards of, of the music managers and music attorneys and, uh, and I have a great music attorney now, and I never had any representation musically, but now people want to know what's after Wheeler, you know? But I really want to see this one through, and and if I do another album, I'd love to keep writing songs, you know, as a tribute to my dad, my brother, and uh, maybe record some of Andrew's songs. And how about acting? Acting, I uh, after Wheeler, I did this big commercial one. I went from my pet project into the prequel to Leatherface for Lionsgate, which is a... Uh, Wait a minute. You're in what? It's the prequel to um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, so it's called Leatherface, and I don't know when it's dated. It's not dated yet, but it will be out this year, but that's a big one. That's a commercial. It's for the, uh, the horror fans. You know, it's me and Lily Taylor and some really good actors, and it takes place in the 50s and 60s before the, supposedly before the 70s film came out. Big budget? Yeah, pretty big. It was, you know... I'd say middle middle ground, but it kind of in a cool, cool way. Who Great directors. Play? I play um, 
I'm the lead of it. I play Hal Hartman, who is a, a sheriff, and these kids uh, that are growing up on that Sawyer farm do something bad to my daughter, and uh, and I go after them, <laughs> oh. and it ends in a bloody, a bloody mess. Avenge. <laughs> But um, yeah, and there's some cool well, films that I saw. Massacre was a major. Yeah, this is I think a big. You know, I don't really do horror movies that much, and this was a really good script. And the directors were from France, and I love their this movie they made called The Inside, which was a small little French film that uh, they showed me. And and Hollywood's been after them to come over at the pond to do uh, do a genre picture, and they chose this one. So. Was uh, being young and making money and being in movies was that? Did that hurt in any way? I think it's very... There's a lot of people who start young have too much too soon. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, growing up in, in this crazy town, as I did from four, four months old, um, was born in Atlanta where my dad went to college, moved here. As my dad started doing well, I went to private schools all around L.A. with movie stars' kids. But I think it can be very disillusioning as far as materialism, success, you know, there's a lot of things that look appealing. You know, I, I credit my I, I credit my mom and dad and and my kind of such a tight-lipped kind of childhood in the way that my mom was so overprotective of me and my brother Andrew that I think that's why I never went off the deep end. I always had this little voice that was my mom saying, "You don't want to do that," you know. And I think that's why, even with my kind of rebellious choices and the stories I read about me, I've never been arrested, I've never, you know, you're not going to read or see that TMZ story about boys. me. No, no, you know, I've never really, I've only been in those rags when I've dated a girl and, you know, they have a story to tell for never the most been married. part. Never married? Never been married, kind of a late bloomer, 43. I, uh, was your brother married? He wasn't, he was married once and um, that only lasted about a year and a half. Um, I think that was really for my mom because we lost our mother uh, nine years ago. My mom, Nancy, a uh, beautiful lady and was just a great mother. And I think that's why, uh, you know, she was worried about me for sure because I was asked to leave a lot of schools and I probably said things. Were you things. a bad boy? You know, I was just the kind of the crazy one of the fam. You know, my dad was this melodic, quiet, you know, songwriter writing hits for great artists. My mom was this creative in the background great mother that chose to give us that and not work, um, really be a full-time mom. My brother was a straight-A student and kind of the quiet one always giggling in the corner at me and I was the one that was running around in my underwear dressed as Spider-Man, jumping on tables, telling my piano teacher to go F himself, you know, I mean, just when I, when I felt his hand touch my leg in a weird way, I basically <laughs> told him what I thought. So I was just kind of an un unfiltered, kind of the one that obviously was destined for my crazy business. And, so you uh, live by yourself? Yeah, I live in Malibu. I've got some good friends, and but uh, yeah, I'm single. And Dorf is the real name, right? Dorf, yeah, it means little village in German, but that's with one F. Two Fs, uh, not sure what it means, but it is German. You're yeah. with two Fs. Yeah. Not exactly a stage name, right? No, and my dad, funny enough, because I went uh, on the set of a Clint Eastwood movie, because after Every Which Way But Loose, my dad had written a lot for Clint. And um, I remember seeing a kid on the set, and I was like, how does he go to school, Dad? How is he here with all these adults? And he's like, well, he goes to school on the set. And I was like, ching! <laughs> I was like, that's what I'm doing. And uh, that really was my hook. When we come back, more about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre prequel and more about Wheeler. And after the break, the biggest risk Stephen has taken. We'll be right back. This is the CD from the movie Wheeler. It's in theaters now, in select theaters. And you and your brother wrote the songs. Yeah, Andrew and I uh, wrote Pour Me Out of This Town with our... Pour Me Out of This Town. Yeah, and that's kind of the main single from the film. He One of the titles is She's Only 20. What's that about? She's Only 20 was one of the first songs I wrote for, uh, because normally you have a movie and the idea or a script and then you write original songs, right, for the film. On this one we had just songs and then we created this character as a vehicle to get the songs out there and to tell the story. So She's Only 20 came from, uh, is a song about Wheeler uh, meeting a 20 year old and being 10 years older on this farm in Texas where he comes from and her daddy not liking it too much but we had a little, uh, <laughs> make out in back of the barn and uh doing a horror movie 
You know, when I didn't. You, when you see the finished product, you learn a lot about it, right? Yeah, because I just you don't did all kill the people. Right? Yeah, no, I mean, I did all the sound work on it, and I've done a lot of stuff with swords and blade, and I've definitely had my fair share of the fake blood in movies uh, over the years. But uh, um, why do we like them? I think you know. I don't know. I guess uh, they definitely vampires definitely got a lot more popular after Blade. Right. I think uh, the great a great horror film like this new movie I really want to see with that cool actor um, um, James uh, Mac is it or uh, James McAvoy? It's this movie uh, oh, I Split. Saw. Oh, what a movie! It's and the it, number it, one movie. Yeah, now. and it's done really well, and it kind of came scary. out of nowhere. And I want to see this it's movie because I like personality. Oh. Let's play a game of If You Only Knew. Funniest fan encounter. Funniest fan encounter. Um, probably when I met Liberace, and also. How about what did you run into a funny fan come up? Oh, oh, you? oh, oh! Not my favorite. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Um, yeah, probably my 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 funniest of a fan ended up being a fake fan because I got punked on that Ashton Kutcher show. Oh, he punked you? Oh, big time! Yeah, and uh, it was it all had to do with a fake fan that was incredibly believable. I mean, I still to this day wonder what he's doing because he's a good actor. You know, he pretended to be my fan and sent over all this uh, champagne and food, and I was really like, "Stop already! You know, you really enough already. You, you, it's all good. Thank you, thank you." And the, the friends are waving, and then I get this, I ask for my bill, which was, I had just had one drink, and they gave me a bill for 9,500 bucks. <laughs> I was in there for 20 minutes. I said, well, guys, and then the waiter was really good, too, so they really had me, and uh, that was kind wow, of like that's the height of that show, yeah. Childhood celebrity crush? Um, probably Demi Moore uh, from Blame It on Rio, that Michael Caine movie. Guilty pleasure? Smoking and drinking rosé. You smoke? Yeah. I smoked till I had a heart attack. You could stop. You don't think you could stop, but you could stop. I'm gonna. Proud of, everyone says that. Proudest accomplishment? Um, my proudest accomplishment probably would be this movie because we, right. we started it in the living room and we saw it through. Biggest risk you've taken? Probably this movie. I think this one, singing, playing live. We just played the Ryman Theater, which is that famous stage, and well, I, I was never been more nervous in my life. And last week we played with Little Big Town and all these great acts. And my wife sang at the Ryman Theater. I introduced her. Oh wow! That was very nervous. It's, it's incredible. The stage is magic. Something you wish you were better at? Um, basketball. Sports, maybe. Uh, what never ceases to make you laugh? Don Rickles. Me too. Grew up with him. Oh, he's amazing. I love <laughs> that guy. Best piece of advice you ever got? Uh, don't read the reviews, just count them. <laughs> Worst piece of advice? To not do a John Waters movie when he wrote it for me, and I love him, and he's still a friend to this day. You didn't do it. I did do it. But the advice was don't do it. Uh, biggest splurge? Um, probably when I bought my first painting. I bought a painting, and uh, my business manager, I don't think, knew that I was buying an original painting, and it was a Warhol. And I thought he th think, I think he still thought that I was buying a print. And I said, no, man, I'm getting this painting for this number because I'm getting it through Larry Gagosian and Tony Shafrazi that are friends of mine, and because... It's a painting that was done in the 80s. This is a canvas. This is going to go up in money. And this was in 99. And uh, he told me not to buy it. I bought that, too. What Warhol was it? It was a camouflage painting, uh, 40 by 44. I ended up selling it years later, but I made a lot of money on it. <laughs> Whew. Uh, something on your bucket list? Oh, uh, to skydive. You would do it? Yeah. Who would you trade places with for a day? Uh, Jack Nicholson. He's your friend, right? Yeah. yeah. I'd love to walk in his shoes for a day. Something you long believed to be true but realized isn't? That good people will endure and last. You know, and I guess I just think of my brother on that one, you know, and just I wrote a line in Wheeler in an improv that I was doing in the car which says, uh, bad things happen to good people. It's the way of the world. And I put that into something that we had created for the Wheeler backstory that happened in his life. And I was thinking of my mom in that one, but I'd have to now make it about my mom and my brother because they were great people. A great rabbi people. passed away. He's a rabbi psychologist, wrote a book called Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Really? 
I'll pick it up. There's no good answer to it, is there? No. And there must be some weird reason, but we don't know. Something people don't know about you. <clears throat> that I... Um, sensitive and that I, uh, I care about, uh, the world and Have people. Have you been close to being married? Not really. No? No, uh, probably for my own, my own reasons, but... Have uh, you ever been in love? Yeah. Yeah, I have a few times. Did she break it up or you broke it up? I probably screwed it up. Screwed it up. Ah. Uh. Stephen will answer your social media questions in our final segment. The movie is Wheeler. This is the CD, and it's in theaters now. We're back with Stephen Dorff. The movie is Wheeler, and we have some social media questions. Jeremy David tweets, is there going to be another Blade movie? Who knows? I'd be, uh, I'd be down. And uh, Steve Norrington, who made the original, just came to my Wheeler premiere. And he's kind of a recluse director, but uh, I'd love to recreate Deacon Frost. It seems like a character I can't seem to hmm. ever uh, get over, because people always talk about it. Annabelle Klein wants to know if you would consider a career in country music. I would. You know, I would consider singing and writing songs my way, doing it you know, kind of my way. I don't think I would um, give up my day job, but uh, I, I do love writing songs, and frankly, through this film, I love playing for people. Why do you like acting? I've always loved acting because I love the idea of a chameleon. I love the idea of looking at people and, and being able to, if it's a guy from London at a bar, being able to fill his shoes, and I've always been a great mimic. I've always been able to tap into emotion. Uh, whether it's playing the good guy, the bad guy, or in between. Now I'm playing fathers, because I'm an old man. <laughs> um, you but, observe people, though. That's yeah, I love I'm observing, and I love bringing them to life in a realistic way. Brando told me the problem was when he got famous, he couldn't observe anymore, because they were observing him. Him, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, Abigail Chosen wants to know about your experience shooting the Every Time music video with Britney Spears in which you rescue her from drowning in a bathtub. <laughs> what was that about? Yeah, it seemed like every 10, 15, or every 10, 12 years, my agent would talk me into doing one of these video clips, so I keep the, keep the, the youth alive, I guess. And uh, Britney and David LaChapelle, who's a great photographer and director, uh, asked me to be in that, and I got there. I really liked the song. He told me the concept that I was going to get into a fight with her, we're going to break a lot of vases in the room, and then she was going to be in the bathtub unconscious, and I was going to save her. And I said, let's do it. <laughs> and uh, we had a good time, and Brittany was really sweet and nice, and uh, I ended up going in in my jeans and my tennis shoes uh, to save her, so, yeah. Lauren, she's a great girl. Yeah. Lauren Califato wants to know the best way to get over a breakup. Mm. Aha. I guess find somebody new. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm not a great breakup, or I just recently had kind of not the greatest breakup, but uh, probably Wait, serves me right. Not the greatest? She broke up with you? Uh, we both were hitting a wall, but she was really young, and so it probably wasn't, wasn't the girl for me, but I did care about her. Do you want to be a father? Um, I would like to be, you know. I would like to give a little piece of me. You're caring. You'd be a good father. I would be a good dad, I think. I got to... Uh, get through a few more things on my own. This, this Andrew thing that just happened with my brother threw kind of a wrench into my life again. So once I can get through this, maybe I will quit smoking and <laughs> find myself a woman. Tell me about the friendship with Jack Nicholson and Dennis Hopper. Oh, man. Well, I was doing a crazy space movie, a uh, terrible movie with Dennis called Space Truckers. And <laughs> not one of my greatest titles, but a lot of, see, your guys love it. Some weirdos really love it. Worried about you in there. Um, no, uh, Dennis Our crew was... loved it, yeah. Yeah, Dennis well, they don't was, know where they are. Dennis was a genius. I work, did it to work with Dennis. It was directed by the guy that did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I, uh, and then from that movie, Bob Rafelson had his eye on me for Blood and Wine with Jack and Michael Caine, and I thought, geez. And Dennis, actually, I wasn't able to go get through the uh, my Jack Nicholson test because you kind of, once you're picked by your director, you got to kind of have a meeting with the man. I wasn't in town to have that meeting. I was with his old pal Dennis in Ireland, you know, playing golf or trying to, because Dennis was really good. I'm not. And uh, Dennis wrote a beautiful um, recommendation for me. And Jack signed my Easy Rider poster when I was in my 20s. And 
And he Does said, he, thank Hop for the recommendation, Dorf. Does he still live on Brando's property? Yeah. He made a park out of that. Oh, did he? It's a beautiful monument for Marlin, yeah. Nothing was built there. It's gorgeous. He's the smartest, most dedicated, talented guy. He drove me crazy. He doesn't do interviews. He He's the me, smart one. He called me up when I left CNN. He said, Larry. Larry, if, I'll do an interview one day. One for day. You, brother. If I do you, I got to do everybody. If I do you, Lair, I got to see Charlie, and I got to visit a couple others. But, Lair, <laughs> I'll hold you close. <laughs> What do, you, what, do you, what do you look for in a project when you get a script? You know, at this time, I'm not really following the rules, so I like to just do what I want to do, and I'm lucky enough to be in that situation. I'm so it ain't the money? No, look, I love money. I uh, sold some e-cigs for a while, made a bunch of money, but it uh, didn't help me quit smoking. Um, thanks a lot, Blue. But, um, no, um, but, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I love money. I love being able to fly my family around and love being able to take trips and do whatever I want to do, be able to see this beautiful Gibson guitar and be able to pay for it, you know, or whatever it is. By but, Warhol. But it's not, yeah, but it's not really, you know, I've been lucky enough to make a great living and, uh, you know, what I'm trying to do now is do films and characters that I can just keep stretching myself and keep creating. This was a totally different challenge and uh, I'm liking that some people are, are responding to it. You know? You're a special guy. Thank you, Larry. You are too. Thank you, Steve. I want to thank my guest, Stephen Dorf. Wheeler is in theaters and available on demand now. And you can also get the CD, in which he is Wheeler Bryson. You can find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.